Hello Statics, this is ENGR 214 Ampersand. This is Bellingham Technical College, winter quarter 2020. And for this lecture we will be uh, diving into internal forces. And this is a prelude to what we'll need to do in beam analysis, which is a very important setup for those of you who will be doing composite design or specifying materials or designing cross sections of, of engineered members uh, because uh, the maximum moment and maximum shear as well as maximum axial stress points will be your your design inputs for anything you do uh, with cross section shaping reinforcement placement and for those who are still working with metals, uh, microstructural refinement. Okay, the easiest way to dive into the idea of internal forces is to take a curved two-force member. So we've got a again a two-force member. So you can really only it can really only support loads that are on a line between the two points of application here at A and B. But unlike a straight two-force member, where that external load is reflected. At the, in the same magnitude and direction at every point along the member itself. Uh, this time that's not going to be the case as we go through the member from one point to the other. So it's definitely a two force member. We have a curved shape. Resultant force acts on a line between A and B just like any two force member. But the internal forces, first of all they're going to change in magnitude with every point and they're not just going to be axial. So the forces won't just be tangent uh, to the curve at every point. Some will be perpendicular and we will also have bending moments. So how do we find them? And more importantly, how do we find them at any point? Well, to do that, we're going to set up a very convenient coordinate system. Uh, it just so happens that this curve shape is circular. So that makes our life really, really simple. And the next important trick that we are going to deploy that you'll definitely do in beams is you're going to cut it. So this is a lot like what you saw with the method of sections where you sectioned a truss and then you represented the, the forces coming from the section you're not looking at by just uh, forces aligned with those members, which you could do because they were straight and two force. We're going to do something similar here, except things aren't straight and they're not two force. We're going to whack this two force member, you know, somewhere here. We're going to set up a coordinate system around the center of the member. Remember, this is a circular shape. So we could define a center point O. This is the origin, which is also the center of the circle. And so we can denote our location along the member by R and theta. So we've set up a little polar coordinate system. So if I want to say, well, where is my cut section? Well, okay, it's at a, at a given R, uh, which says I'm on the member. We're assuming it's thin, so it doesn't really have much of a delta R to it, and at an angle theta, so R theta. Okay, um, if I take away this right-hand section and just focus here on the left, I can get an idea of what forces are on it. Well, I had my applied force F which is being applied at, at point A. And then I have not one, but three different loads coming from this cut section that I've now discarded. I've got a force F that's balancing this one. And then I have a moment. And I'll later on, I'll resolve this force F into a component that is tangent. Uh, to the curvature at this point, or more another way of saying it is normal to the cut, the plane of the cut section, and then another component that's uh, parallel to the plane of the cut section. So I could write conditions of equilibrium for this leftmost section. So I could say that the sum of the moments about the origin, which is a little bit different, we're not taking about A, we're taking about the origin, would be equal to the moment that is produced by this force, which would be R cross F, which would be equal to the magnitude of R, which is the radius of our, of our circle, our circular member, times the magnitude of F times sine theta, because theta here is, is also the angle between these. So there's our, our fundamental definition of moment via cross product. 
and so that's actually pointing in the negative direction by the right hand rule and that's being balanced by whatever moment M here is being applied by this right hand section that we discarded. So those have to balance. The moment produced by this remaining force about point O has to, to balance the moment taken from the remaining section. So some of the moments is zero. And we didn't have to worry about the location of this moment because it's pure moment, kind of like a couple. So we didn't have to care where it was. Whereas in the case of F, we had to use the cross product. And so location versus our, the point about which we were taking moments mattered. So we now have a relationship between the moment that is being uh, induced on this leftmost section by the cutaway right hand section and the force being induced <laughs> or the force being transmitted from it and some location on the member. So we could, we could write a relationship of how M and F uh, change with sine theta as uh, sine theta gets bigger as theta approaches 1 um, the ratio of m to f is going to approach uh, is going to approach r. So moment's going to get bigger, and in fact, it'll hit a maximum there. Okay, and we had said that f it's pointed in a convenient direction relative to the applied force in this particular example. But when we go forward, especially for beam analysis. We're going to want to take that force and we're going to want to always resolve it in two components. One that is perpendicular to the cross section and is therefore going to be pulling axially along the, the beam. Excuse me. And if you're talking about designing a beam, when you find the, the place on the beam that gives you the maximum axial force and you get your maximum axial load, That'll give you insight into maybe what kind of tensile strength of material and cross-section of material you're going to want to use or how much axial reinforcement you would need if you were a, a composites person. The second component of F with respect to this cut face is V, otherwise known as the shear force. And Not surprisingly, this will have impact on what kind of shear stress uh, you need to plan around when you're designing something. And that would be your um, your short and long transverse reinforcement or short and long transverse strengths and yields if you had a monolithic material. Um, bending moment, again, we've already solved for, but that would give you some insight into, say, cross-section. Do you want to go with a big I-beam that has a high moment of inertia and can induce a large moment? Um, and that will also indirectly have impact on placement and amount of axial reinforcement, since those two kind of play in together. So M, N, and V, moment, uh, axial force, and shear force, which change with location, which change with location along something that's not a straight force, two force member are going to have big, big design inputs um, onto cross section and materials. So this is where we really start to uh, intersect with mechanics of materials. This is sort of the jumping off point into mechanics of materials and into uh, material science. So let's do a quick example here. We've got uh, another frame kind of member here. So you've got this, this member ABC, which is not a two force member. Uh, it's being yanked on with 300 newtons up here at point C. It's being held down with a hinge at point A. And then it's being supported by a two force member, BD, uh, with a hinge at point D and another hinge at, at point B. And so we're asked to find the axial and shear forces and bending moments at point P, somewhere here uh, between A and B. We're given some dimensions. And then at point Q, uh, which is partway along the two force member. Okay. So we'll start with our typical strategy for E equilibrium will solve for the support reactions because we're going to need to plug those back in to get anything else. So here's our whole body FBD drawn as a big blob with appropriate dimensions and applied forces and force directions. And we, we roll in the fact, the information that BD is a two force member um, by, by noting that our force D sub X has to be zero if 
if BD is a two force member. So we actually use two pieces of information because you'll notice you've otherwise got one, two, three, four support reactions uh, and our two dimensional condition of equilibrium will only give us three equations. So we get rid of D sub X by invoking the fact that member BD here is a two force member. So otherwise we, we write our standard equations of equilibrium. So sum of the forces in the X is 300 newtons and, and to the right is positive. Minus A sub X minus D sub X equals zero. We invoke the two force member uh, BD and say D sub X has to be zero. So we now know A sub X is equal to 300 newtons pointing in the direction shown. We've only got two vertical forces, A sub Y and D sub Y, so those have to sum to zero. And we can take the sum of the moments about point A uh, to solve for D sub Y. So we have a negative moment uh, being induced by the 300 Newton force with a perpendicular offset of 50 centimeters. And then uh, D sub Y is acting uh, perpendicular at 40 centimeters and so I just algebraically solve that. That gives me D sub Y 375 Newtons upward, J, positive J hat. Uh, by the sum of the forces in the Y, I have A sub Y being uh, negative 375 Newtons. And we have A sub X as negative 300 Newtons reference to our coordinate system. So we got sport reactions. So now we get to cut the beam up, where we get to we get to, to section our member ABC, which is, is effectively acting as a beam. So we're going to section it at P, and that gives us some dimensions. Uh, we can use the dimensions of the original problem to get our theta, so we have our geometry established. We're going to take our 300 newtons A sub X and our 375 newtons A sub Y from our whole body FBD and that gives a starting point here and now we're going to to write the influence of the remaining section that we cut away we know that the portion of of ABC that we hacked off the right hand portion that we hacked away at P can exert a normal force and a shear force V and a bending moment on this remaining left hand section so we're just going to draw those as unknowns. And there's three of them. And I have three conditions of equilibrium available to me in 2D, all of none of which are, are trivial or redundant. So I can solve for all three. I can solve for V and N and M. So all I have to do is set up the geometry. So I will start with the sum of the forces in the X. And I've defined uh, my coordinate system X, Y here with my little I hat, J hat. So it's just a geometry chase now. I take the, uh, the horizontal component of n, n cosine theta. I subtract the horizontal component of v, v sine theta. And I subtract the 300 newtons being applied at a sub x. That equals 0. Sum of the forces in the y is just going to be the flip-flop. And uh, vertical component of the normal f force is n sine theta and axial force. I'm going to add the vertical component of V. So that's V cosine theta. I'm going to subtract my support reaction. Set that equal to zero. And I'm going to take the sum of the moments about point A. That's pretty easy. 300 newtons is going straight through point A, so it produces no moment. 375 newtons going straight through point A. The normal force perpendicular to the cut section is effectively goes through point A, produces no moment. So the only things that can produce moment about point A are the shear force and then of course the applied pure bending moment. So if I know, knew what the, um, the distance along the beam uh, of point P where my cut is, uh, I could in immediately uh, write an expression for the moment produced by, by uh, my shear force V around point A. And I do know that from the geometry of the problem. It's 25 centimeters. So I can say that the sum of the moments about point A is 25 centimeters 
times the magnitude of my shear force V, written in the direction shown, plus M, and that has to sum to zero. So I've got one, two, three equations, and I have one, two, three unknowns, just like I thought. So now I just, now it's an algebra crank. I turn the crank and I solve for, uh, I'd start by probably solving for either one of these. So there's going to be a little bit of substitution going on and follow that through and you get a value of uh, 120 newtons for the shear force, you get 465 newtons for the axial force, and you get negative 3,000 newton centimeters for the moment. So effectively the moment is pulling in the opposite direction. It's going to be rotating clockwise, not counterclockwise as shown. So that would give me great design input if I needed to know what to make the beam out of. Uh, I could use this to establish a cross section and uh, material based on its tensile strength, tensile yield, and ultimate. And I would use this and the cross-section to choose something with the appropriate shear strength. Same thing with moduli. And then uh, the applied bending moment would give me insight into, uh, into how strong uh, the beam would have to be um, based on its maximum tensile axis. So I would be ready to start designing my beam with the information in this box. Okay, that is it for internal forces at a single point. Um, in our next lecture, we will start into uh, internal forces at any point along a loaded beam, any kind of loaded member that can support moment. And so we'll be doing, uh, we'll be diving into a little bit of calculus, adding things up, and uh, evaluating the conditions of equilibrium for a little slice of beam taken at any point from one end. And it's basically going to work quite a bit like this example, except, except instead of a single point P, we'll be solving those equations with respect to some distance X along the length of the beam. So we'll just carry that same kind of idea with us. We'll see you then for the next lecture.